Hello everyone, I'm Eric Lockhart with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Today's webinar is focused on the role of building energy efficiency and successful NDC implementation. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option in a box on the right side. We'll display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask to use the questions pane where you may type in your question. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, the audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solutions Center training page within a few days of the broadcast, and will be added to the Solutions Center YouTube channel, where you will find other informative webinars, as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Sarah Stinson, Meredith Evans, Jennifer Lakey, and Mary Christine Roger who have joined us to discuss linking building energy efficiency and nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. Before we jump into the presentations, I will provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then, following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well, so thank you in advance for taking a moment to fill that out. So the Solutions Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. Uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members, covering 90% of clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> The Solution Center is one of the nine initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Other CEM initiatives include ISGAN, 21CPP, and Global LEAP. All of the initiatives work towards the three overarching goals to improve energy efficiency worldwide, enhance clean energy supply, and expand clean energy access. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States, with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. The Solution Center has five primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It also serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to energy policies and programs. The Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. The Solution Center also fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And lastly, the Solution Center serves as a primary resource for project financing options and information to expand markets for clean energy. This finance technical assistance service of the Solutions Center was announced last year at COP21. Our primary audience is made up of energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. We also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across its suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like SE for All, and regionally focused entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. 
A marquee feature that the Solutions Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with one of the with one of more than 50 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on cl specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of demand and policy evaluation, we are very pleased to have Bruno Lapion from Enerdata serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in energy efficiency or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, first up today is Sarah Stinson, who has been the Director of the Buildings and Industry Division in the Office of Energy Efficiency at Natural Resources Canada since April 2014. Following Sarah, we will hear from Meredith Evans, who is a senior scientist with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the U.S., where she is an energy policy and finance expert with experience working on energy efficiency and clean energy policies and projects in numerous countries. Following Meredith, we will hear from Jennifer Lakey, who is the global director of WRI's energy program, where she oversees initiatives and projects that aim to expand access to clean and affordable energy that will reduce climate risks and strengthen communities worldwide. And our final panelist is Mary Christine Roger, who has been with the Ministry of Energy, Ecology, and the Sea as head of the Buildings Regula Building Regulations Department since 2003 and has extensive experience in buildings and building codes, both in France and within the European Commission more broadly. With those brief introductions, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so um, I think this morning um, my presentation is going to focus on how energy efficiency in the built environment will help Canada achieve its NDC and how horizontal, that is across governments, and vertical, that is with subnational governments in Canada, how collaboration can translate these targets into practical policies and programs. The Government of Canada is committed to taking action to address climate change by setting pathways for our country to reduce its domestic GHG emissions and transition to a resilient, low-carbon economy. Canada's target uh, is 30% reduction in GHG emissions below 2005 levels by 2030. As a vast northern country, Canada faces unique challenges to address climate change. This includes extreme temperatures, large land mass and diversified growing economy with significant natural resources. And these circumstances influence our, our greenhouse gas emissions. However, despite these challenges, Canada has one of the cleanest electrical systems among G7 and G20 nations. Since 2011, Canada's per capita GHG emissions have been at their lowest levels since tracking began in 1990, while our economy has continued to grow. As noted in Canada's NDC, uh, the Government of Canada has taken previous action to reduce GHG emissions, and these include, for example, establishing stringent regulatory standards to reduce emissions in the industrial, transportation, and electrical sectors, as well as overseeing the operation of science and technology programs aimed at advancing clean technology. Meeting Canada's commitments under the Paris Agreement requires an intensification and acceleration of domestic actions on climate change already underway. Mobilizing the efforts of all levels of government in Canada, as well as engaging Indigenous peoples, civil society, business, and individual Canadians is a key factor in achieving progress towards both our short-term and long-term outcomes. The focal point of federal, provincial, and territorial efforts in Canada over the last year has been on developing the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, or as we call it uh, in Canada here, the PCF, which was formally adopted uh, in early December by the Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau and provincial and territorial leaders. The Pan-Canadian Framework is Canada's plan to both address climate change and grow our economy. 
It represents an important step in putting in place the necessary actions to help Canada meet or exceed its 2030 target. The framework will build upon existing federal, provincial, territorial climate change actions and build a competitive and resilient low carbon economy. The Pan-Canadian framework is publicly available on the Government of Canada website. In transitioning to a low carbon economy, Canadians will use energy more efficiently and uh, an increasing portion of the energy used in homes, businesses and vehicles will come from cleaner renewable sources. The Pan-Canadian Framework also calls for modernizing the electrical system to expand energy storage, updating infrastructure, and deploying smart grid technologies to accelerate the phase-out of coal-fired electricity sources that will contribute to the decarbonization of the economy. Complementary actions in uh, other sectors include the built environment, industry, forestry, agriculture, and waste. Existing measures uh, will deliver 89 megatons of GHG reductions. The Pan-Canadian Framework, uh, as a vision, aims to uh, reduce 86 megatons, and other related measures, such as green infrastructure and technology innovation, will deliver the remaining 44 megatons required to achieve our objectives. These reductions would be in the year 2030 from a level of 742 megatons down to the targeted 523 megatons in 2030. 742 megatons is the forecasted business as usual level of emissions in 2030, published in December 2016. Horizontal coordination among federal departments, as well as vertical coordination between levels of government in Canada, allows the federal government to forecast the collective GHG impacts across all measures to eliminate the possibility of double counting. So turning to the more specifics around the built environment, to give you a snapshot of uh, what that looks like in Canada, currently 17% of Canada's total GHG emissions come from homes and buildings. The Canadian residential market is made up of about 14 million homes, and Canadians spend a little over $28 billion on home energy use uh, in 2013 alone, and spending for buildings was a little over $20 billion. 600,000 commercial and institutional buildings are, uh, are comprise the workplace and are occupied by 743 million square meters in 2013. About 75% of the forecasted building stock in 2030 uh, already exists, while the remaining 25% will be built in the coming years. As previously mentioned, Canada is a relatively cold country. Uh, as a result of that, space and water heating account for over 80% of the energy requirements in the built environment. More than 80% of this load is met by GHG emitting sources such as natural gas, heating oil, and fossil fuel-powered electricity. Appliances and lighting almost exclusively use electricity. As also previously mentioned, Canada is fortunate to have one of the cleanest electrical systems among G20 nations, with almost 80% of our electricity supply already emitting no greenhouse gases. We are improving our GHG performance through measures such as more efficient building envelopes and heating equipment, Total built environment GHG emissions have fallen over 12% between 2005 and 2013, despite an almost 17% uh, increase in total floor space in Canada. But more remains to be done. Federal, provincial, territorial collaboration on energy efficiency is paramount for success. Energy efficiency is an area of shared jurisdiction in Canada between the national and subnational levels of government. And achieving an ambitious target for the built environment in the Pan-Canadian framework will require significant collaborations across all orders of government. While the federal government in Canada regulates energy efficiency standards for equipment and appliances, our provinces and territories regulate energy use in buildings through codes, as well as some product standards. Municipalities also play a key role in, in implementing and enforcing building codes and delivering building retrofit programs. All jurisdictions must work together to achieve reductions in this sector. 
So turning back now to uh, the specific measures that were, are reflected in, for the built environment in the Pan-Canadian framework, I will briefly touch on uh, the five key initiatives that are outlined in there. The first is net zero energy ready codes, which will ensure that new buildings in Canada are constructed to the most energy efficient uh, level possible. Energy codes for existing buildings raise the prominence of energy savings considerations during major renovations. Labeling and disclosure measures make more visible the information consumers and businesses need to make informed decisions about energy consumption of buildings, helping to pull the market towards greater levels of efficiency. Equipment and appliance initiatives can provide leadership on the minimum energy performance of key technologies. And of course, collaborative R&D efforts will accelerate innovation in the built environment and bring new high performing and lower cost technologies to market sooner. Throughout the development of the Pan-Canadian framework, Canada was guided by international best practices by our, via our bilateral relationships and our involvement with organizations such as the IEA and IPEAC, as well as various clean energy ministerial initiatives. I'd be very interested uh, during the discussion portion of this webinar to hear about some of the experiences of others uh, in, in implementing energy efficiency measures in the built environment, particularly in the context of a federated governance structure. So to drill down a little bit on those, uh, on those key areas that, uh, that Canada has uh, developed a vision for in the built environment, Codes for new buildings fall within provincial and territorial jurisdiction in Canada um, as they have to take into account regional and regulatory differences. Model codes for subnational adoption are developed at the federal level with significant input from subnational governments, industry, and other stakeholders. The Pan-Canadian framework includes a vision for reaching net zero energy ready model building code by 2030 which will require a roadmap consisting of increasingly stringent tiers for adoption. A net zero home costs more in the beginning, but pays off over time with operating costs that are 30 to 50%, 55% lower. Research and development will help reduce construction costs, and Canada's data has indicated these costs have already dropped by 40% in the last decade. In Canada, we are looking to the rest of the world for best practices and new technologies to address some of the challenges associated with reducing the incremental cost of building to net zero energy ready. Again, I'm very interested in hearing about some of the international experiences with developing net zero energy ready building codes. With respect to energy codes for existing buildings, um, in Canada, 75% of buildings uh, already standing will still be in existence in 2030. Um, and so maximizing their efficiency is paramount. We will be working with provinces and territories and other stakeholders to develop a model retrofit code by 2022, which for subsequent adoption by provinces and territories um, after that and as appropriate. Options such as connecting the code to building permits for renovations and scaling requirements uh, to the depth of retrofit activity are being considered. This could include, for example, recommissioning requirements to improve performance by optimizing uh, building systems. The federal role in this particular case would include potentially developing tools, best practices, or providing funding to support subnational incentive programs. And during our research, we noted that there's been a lack of, a, a, a relative lack of international experience with respect to energy codes for existing buildings. Um, again, we're interested in learning from others, and so where those experiences have been undertaken, we would welcome the opportunity to, uh, to engage on, on that with you. Moving on uh, to the third key element uh, for the built environment in the Canadian Pen, uh, the Pen Canadian framework um, is uh, labeling and disclosure of energy use in buildings, which encourages retrofits by providing transparent information regarding energy performance. This allows owners and building managers to benchmark energy use and estimate energy costs. In the context of the Pen Canadian framework, Federal, provincial, and territorial governments will strive to require labeling of building energy use 
by as early as 2019. A nationally harmonized approach in Canada would facilitate implementation and lower development costs. We will need to coordinate the development of a standard for energy disclosure based on existing labeling and expansion of benchmarking tools that Natural Resources Canada currently provides and supports. These include, for example, our EnerGuide label and the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Support. Um, we will also need to support a national labeling benchmarking system that can underpin provincial and territorial regulation. Finally, the Pan-Canadian framework includes a commitment for the federal government to set new standards for heating equipment and other key technologies to the highest level of efficiency that is economically and technically achievable. Energy efficiency standards for equipment and appliances save consumers and businesses money on their energy bills. An early market signal by the government in the form of an intention to introduce standards by a specific year can motivate the market to accelerate the uptake of targeted technologies. Regulations can be supported by actions to educate consumers, demonstrate benefits, and overcome market barriers. For example, Canada's EnerGuide label tells consumers how much energy is required to run their equipment and appliances. The Energy Star brand is highly recognized by consumers and identifies the highest efficiency products. In the context of the NDC, this will be particularly relevant for reducing GHG emissions from the very large space and water heating load, most of which is derived from natural gas combustion. Subnational governments in Canada can help pave the way to regulations by first providing incentives through their utilities to early adopters who purchase high efficiency furnaces furnaces and water heaters in advance of regulations coming into place. Beyond heating equipment, energy efficiency standards on other products also deliver GHG reduction. By 2020, Canada will have about 60 new and updated standards in place. To conclude, um, I would like to draw, uh, make a few recommendations based on Canada's experience of linking some of these programs of linking programs and policies to the NDC. In Canada, the federal government will continue to work with subnational governments and industry to support the built environment measures, such as codes, labels, and equipment standards. From our experience, best practices to align built environment policies and programs with NDCs include national collaboration among different levels of government which is key to aligning policies with implementation. We must collaborate horizontally at the federal level with our counterparts to ensure that GHG reduction estimates are aligned, consistently estimated, and only counted once. Engagement is also important as consumers, businesses, and other stakeholders' support is required to realize our GHG reduction. Indigenous communities are particularly important as some are most impacted by climate change while having the least capacity to reduce emissions and adapt to a changing environment. The northern Canadian Arctic has seen more dramatic changes than anywhere else, and these communities are highly dependent on GHG-intensive diesel fuel. We must also report on results for continuous improvement. Adjust actions when results are not being achieved is also key. Critical is having good data. We need to know how energy is being used to determine where the greatest GHG reductions can be found. Canada has a robust system for the built environment in all energy and use sectors. The Pan-Canadian framework includes actions to improve coordinated measurement and reporting of GHG outcomes. For particularly large countries like Canada with diverse climate zones, local decision making for the built environment is helpful for maximizing our reductions as specific climate and other circumstances can be factored into these decisions. While there's much work to be done on the Pan-Canadian framework, there is interest and commitment from all parties in identifying ways to improve Canada's built environment. I look forward to hearing from you about the experiences of others during the discussion portion of this webinar. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Meredith. Great, thank you. Um, 
let me just get this up. So uh, I wanted to share a few um, insights Sorry, regarding. I, Sorry is to interrupt. Okay if you could just go full screen. Uh, sure. Um, Sorry for the delay. Yeah. Is that okay? It shows uh, it shows your your current slide and the next slide. There might it might be that um, uh, the duplicate okay. projector setting. Yeah. Uh, if it's not easy to adjust, we can go this way too. Um. Sorry, my screen is just. I don't. It may for time's sake. It may be easier if you run it from your side. Um. It's just being fussy this morning, unfortunately. No problem. Um, you, you can get started and we'll pull it up. Sure. OK. So um, thank you again, everyone, for participating. I uh, wanted to share a little bit of, is this OK now, Sean? Anyhow, well, I'll keep we moving. Some information on the links between NDCs and building energy efficiency. Um, we reviewed uh, the NDCs that countries have submitted, in particular regarding what they share on um, on buildings. Um, so, you know, as as many of you know, 190 parties um, accounting for some 97 percent of global emissions have submitted INDCs. Uh, buildings account for about a third of global final energy use and, and global emissions. Um, and while that sounds great on, uh, at first glance because it's such a large share of total emissions, there's, it's still clear that many um, opportunities to save energy in buildings can be hard to tap. Um, for example, the IEA estimates that only 20% of the potential energy efficiency savings in buildings are captured today. Furthermore, translating um, NDCs into policies and programs can be challenging um, for other reasons, such as translating commitments on a national level to actions at a more local scale. Okay. Um, the encouraging action in this sector um, is can be difficult also from an international platform like the UNFCCC to buildings which are typically governed locally. So how to best build those links and how to um, ensure that we're getting the most um, energy savings and the most emissions reductions that we can out of the building sector. That was really the idea behind this webinar. And, and then in addition, there's the idea that the building sector is very complex. Jennifer Lakey will also speak to this. There, there are many different um, partners who have to work together on um, creating buildings. So between homeowners, builders, developers, investors, as well as um, government officials. So in the study, um, we basically looked at the NDCs and tallied up the number of countries that mentioned buildings or construction or housing um, and energy efficiency in their NDCs. Um, we also, to the extent that it's possible, we looked at countries that have published NDC implementation plans and um, examined how they're addressing buildings there. Because sometimes the NDCs themselves are rather gene um, general and the implementation plans may provide more detail on what a country is actually planning to do in the building sector. <clears throat> so of the countries um, those of the countries that submitted NDCs, 53 mention um, building efficiency. Uh, and that, of course, excludes the EU because the EU had a um, combined NDC that was, uh, did not go into sectoral details. 38 of the countries um, mentioned building energy codes or regulations. And um, 11 of those mentioned existing building policies and measures. So that speaks a little bit to the challenge that countries are going to have going forward in clarifying exactly how they are going to achieve their NDC goals, and, and um, in particular in the building sector. Um, the majority of countries do not yet have NDC implementation strategies. Uh, so that also represents an opportunity for countries to begin to flesh out these plans. Of the total NDCs that mention building efficiency, 63% um, uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, of the countries that mention building efficiency, they cover 63% of global um, energy use in buildings. So it's a substantial share, and that, that percent is likely to rise further as countries that have more um, general NDCs begin to mention details in their NDC implementation plans. So, for example, six additional countries, in addition to those 53, six additional countries, many of them EU countries, mention building efficiency in their climate strategies. Um, looking at the top energy, building energy consumers globally, uh, you can see that the majority do, in fact, reference um, building energy efficiency in their NDCs. Um, however, several don't have NDC implementation strategies. And importantly, several large um, building energy consumers, such as Russia, um, Nigeria, and Indonesia in particular, don't yet have um, details of any sort on buildings related to their NDCs. Um, so the, looking at the strategies that the NDCs mentioned, it's a range of um, different strategies, uh, not unlike what we just heard from Sarah regarding Canada. They, um, where there's detail, it can include things like building energy codes for either new or, in some cases, existing building stock, energy efficiency resource standards, rating systems, renovation targets, and, um, in some cases, energy consumption goals. Looking forward, a couple of um, things that seem important to, to think about um, include how best to link the national and subnational. Um, it can be overwhelming for local governments to uh, try to learn from international best practice, but at the same time, uh, if we are going to achieve the maximum energy savings possible, we need to find better and faster ways to um, to support local governments as they work on building energy efficiency. Um, also, the link, in many cases, uh, at the national level between environment officials and officials that work on construction. Um, they may not always be in the same ministry. They may not have um, strong uh, working relationships today, so that and that can be a barrier to energy savings and links with the NDC. So that, that in in some countries can be an important area to to consider. Um, public private partnerships uh, also can help in facilitating um, uh, work in this area, and many companies in um, industrial organizations and professional organizations have also taken a leading role in trying to promote energy efficiency in buildings. Um, so with that, I'd like to close and hand the baton over to um, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Mary. Good morning, all, and thank you to the organizers for including me in the webinar today. I'm delighted to get a chance to share with you uh, some of our thinking on NDC implementation and the role of public-private collaboration. I'm just checking to make sure that the coming up on your screen now. And if you, if you wouldn't mind just full screening it. Yep. There we go. Perfect. So. <clears throat> For those of you who are not as familiar with World Resources Institute, uh, let me just say uh, we're a global um, uh, development and environment organization focused on bringing ideas into action to help solve the most challenging uh, development uh, issues and environmental challenges we face. Clearly, climate change is one of the critical areas that we work on. I lead the energy program and in that capacity work with our cities team to focus on uh, how to build a robust strategy around building efficiency at the national level as well as at sub-national level. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, that opportunity uh, today. So just um, moving quickly through to talk about our, our topic, which is around energy efficiency in the building sector. And unfortunately, my slides are not forwarding. So let's just, here we go. Um, we recognize the urgency in the, um, the debate and the opportunities that we have for efficiency to contribute 
Uh, we are, at this point, focused on four particular areas of work, sustainable development goals. Um, energy um, is one of the sustainable development goals. Uh, the opportunity to transform our economy, to deliver sustainable development and uh, climate targets. And we do a lot of work through the Sustainable Energy for All, which allows us to, to focus uh, very uh, exclusively in on the opportunities to uh, double the amount of renewables in the global energy mix and to uh, it, double the rate uh, of improvement in energy efficiency worldwide, as well as the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We have about a decade uh, to create the scale of change that we know the science dictates we need to do to stay below two degrees and hopefully put us on a 1.5 degree trajectory. Unfortunately, the new climate economies work has indicated that we are uh, accelerating our decoupling of energy and emissions, but we're not getting there fast enough. We will need to significantly increase the rate and scale of investment in a new set of solutions and bring to market uh, these solutions within a very uh, accelerated time horizon. In doing that, we recognize that the private sector will need to be a critical investor and the private sector is going to be helping to deliver what the new climate economy w uh, estimates to be a, the needed $90 trillion in infrastructure investment. That's an increase in 37% towards energy efficiency, uh, an increase of 31% in low carbon infrastructure solutions, and the recognition that much of that investment needs to move into the emerging markets and the developing world. That level of funding is unprecedented and certainly is not going to be exclusively the domain of aid institutions. But we also know that we have the opportunity to focus now on specific areas of rapid growth for those investments. If we can help build a market around buildings, we see that floor area expectations continue to expand dramatically. That's in due part due to the rapid urbanization that's occurring. Um, about uh, they, they estimate between 50 and 70 percent of the buildings in much of the uh, emerging cities are yet to be built. Uh, so we're looking at major growth, expansion, and opportunity. So the question is, are our NDCs and is our engagement with the private sector going to help transform a business as usual construction and development uh, agenda, which has traditionally focused on supply side, low carbon energy, and focus instead on delivering the uh, comfort, the safety, and the low carbon structures that will enable uh, our communities to deliver against our development goals at the same time they're delivering on our climate ambition. When we look at this, we see that the problem with buildings is paramount. Um, this is a chart that we put together looking at the, the durable lifespan of many of the types of um, uh, investments that an individual or a corporation may make in the energy efficiency space. And if we don't focus on the built environment and buildings as structures, we very quickly see um, a, a problem in the stranded assets and in the lock-in effect associated with the built environment. So again, accelerating that investment rapidly is essential. And as we know, the private sector is responsible for financing, building, owning, and operating most building stock, which leads us to a very important set of questions around how we are changing BAU and how we're getting the market to function to demand a better performance in the built environment, and especially how we do that as we're thinking about the uh, very real financial constraints that an average consumer or a small business may face in the, some of the uh, uh, emerging economies and developing countries. The IFC has estimated and has, has published a report recently looking at the investment potential, again trying to get investors interested in this sector. Uh, buildings are uh, listed as one of the highest opportunities, $900 billion of investment potential in the Latin America and the Caribbean alone. Uh, that's a significant opportunity, and yet we know that the market is not yet functioning to deliver this. 
So where are the challenges in the market for a private sector engagement on this challenge? Uh, well, it's, it's around the, the ability of the consumer and the supplier of efficiency services uh, to, to connect. Um, how to access and tap into an understanding that there is a, an opportunity here that, that can be uh, beneficial to the consumer, that can lower their monthly operating costs or make their building uh, more um, comfortable and safe, uh, that there's an opportunity to think about technologies, uh, but how those technologies are available to a building owner. Uh, are they uh, understandable and are they very little? So is this a technology that is in the market today? Um, how do people make decisions around the impact or the performance of that technology? Uh, and where and how do they find the funding in order to create that investment? So we have a disconnect, and we need a set of, uh, of investments uh, that uh, right now are not structured to be able to create the scale. So WRI, along with many partners, uh, wrote a, a revision of a book that uh, Johnson Controls uh, had uh, published early on, focusing on the, the opportunities and, and eight actions that urban leaders could take uh, to build environmental um, building efficiency standards and to focus on the city level implementation, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. And this harkens up to back to uh, uh, to Sarah's comments. Uh, specifically around the link between subnational and national. So when we look at the policy agenda, there are at least four areas where there um, are very strong uh, opportunities for NDCs. And when we looked at the NDCs as they were published, um, 36 did mention codes and standards, 15 specifically mentioned technology or appliance standards, uh, 12 had mentioned audits or performance information and certification, and only seven focused on uh, including incentives or finance mechanisms to improve the marketplace for energy efficiency. Again, if we're trying to think about a combined public-private collaboration around NDC implementation going forward, codes and standards are a top-down policy measure. Incentives and finance can help deliver uh, the outcomes. And yet we know that as of now, that private sector engagement portion, when you just look at the numbers in the NDC, has not yet been thought through and could use additional in, uh, approaches in order to make those happen. And the codes and standards, although it's top down, requires implementation strategies that link a national aspiration established through an NDC with a local strategy for uh, implementation, for adoption and or adaption, ad adaptation of a local of a national code to a local circumstance, and then the ability for the private sector uh, to perform against those requirements, and that requires things like uh, the verification and enforcement capacity to act. So we're thinking about these policies, priorities, and engagement strategies to build the market and to overcome the challenges we face. So we think that one of the mechanisms we're using today uh, within WRI under the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All offers um, a model, a model for building out this kind of implementation strategy that NDCs will require. We're focused on working with some of the um, aspirational and inspirational cities around the world that are seeking to link building efficiency to their city's development activities. Often, as in the case of Mexico City, there are um, aspir aspirational goals around uh, emission reductions for climate change agenda, but there are also very important local sustainable development benefits that are sought, such as uh, con uh, congestion or pollution reduction in the context of Mexico City's uh, uh, emissions reduction targets. And thinking about these cities, um, there are the opportunities to build collaborative engagements, which is what our Building Efficiency Accelerator has done. With over 35 organizations and businesses, we're focused on a collaborative process in cities uh, that bring technical expertise and, uh, exper and experience in building markets uh, to the city administrations who often may have a permitting department, may have a budget or a treasury to finance department, and an environment department that have not got the technical expertise to ask the question, how do we deliver better buildings to our city? Even if they recognize that the uh, opportunity for an improved infrastructure is one of their goals, 
to what extent have they been able to find the mechanism to uh, access international technology expertise and finance to be able to deliver against those cities targets that requires you have a marketplace that's functional a, an investment uh, community that's knowledgeable and a link to your public uh, goals at the national level this is infrastructure and an ecosystem that has yet to be built in many places we hope the building efficiency accelerator work can demonstrate the pathway forward we're one of six different accelerators under Sustainable Energy for All, all working on varying uh, aspects of this transformation, whether it's through uh, standards and equipment uh, appliance harmonization uh, standards around the world, um, or thinking about uh, the energy supply and the district energy solutions that could be available both of which link to buildings. The appliances, and lighting, and district energy solutions are all part of the ecosystem in which buildings are consumers of energy. So what does it take to make that alignment happen, to help move us to implementation? I'd offer a few closing thoughts. First, uh, we really will need to, um, to very carefully map the national to local uh, jurisdictional authority look at governance issues around this, and help bridge the policy community. Um, and I was uh, pleased to see, and I think in both, um, in both Meredith's and Sarah's presentations, again, this reference to where are we heading in terms of standards, and the need for our standards to continue uh, to evolve uh, and to be implemented locally uh, with an aspiration to being passive or net zero uh, at the building or community scale uh, within the next two decades. Yeah. Clearly, we need to have an awareness and capacity uh, for technical advice and support for these markets to function. There needs to be trust in the solutions, and there needs to be local capacity uh, around how to deploy them and how to manage the technologies. The third area that I'd offer is around implementation risk. And this data collection, the ability to do verification and enforcement, to build the capacity uh, to, to uh, work with the policymakers and the private sector uh, around the performance of within the sector. This is critical, and the private sector has a lot to offer in that regard as well. We'll need to increase the incentives for a changed construction uh, and energy efficient uh, finance uh, package. We'll need to build local capacity among financial institutions and de create dedicated funds uh, to allow for those uh, it, for solutions to come to market. And finally, in working with cities, it's very clear that the financial constraints in the public sector will need to be overcome through new funding mechanisms and approaches. Uh, we've seen a emerging ESCO industry worldwide. We've certainly seen that play out in a, in a scale through the EESL program for street lighting in India. And we have in the United States, Canada, uh, we have a, an ESCO model that works in both a public-private partnership, a 3P arrangement to build new infrastructure and buildings, as well as in the uh, opportunities to provide uh, new uh, types of revolving loan funds and other resources in, that have been tested in other markets as well. But clearly, the ability to capitalize on the long-term cost uh, and the long-term affordability of energy-efficient technologies needs to change the way we do our budgeting, and cities and national governments are going to need to work collectively to help overcome the budgetary constraints that are, we face in trying to move the investment into this sector. So thank you very much for the opportunity to join you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, before we turn to Mary Christine, I just wanted to remind uh, all the attendees uh, to put questions into the questions pane if you have them along the way, uh, and we'll get to them after Mary Christine's uh, presentation. Hello. Hi, uh, yes, we, Hello, we can see your Paris. slides and we can hear you. Yes? Yes. Hello from Paris. I'm very happy and good afternoon, everybody, because it's the afternoon here in Paris. <laughs> Uh, I'm very happy to give uh, an overview of the way France is acting now to tackle building uh, energy efficiency issues. Um, it is uh, very important, sorry, oh, it's not the right slide, sorry, I have to. 
go back to the first one. Sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. So, uh, first, is it, it is important to keep in mind that for all the European countries, NDCs are actually um, oh, are actually a common agreement valid for all the member states amongst which France objects. Uh, so EU and its member states are committed to combined targets of an at least 40 percent. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, it is important to, uh, so sorry, so EU and its member states are committed to combined targets of an at least 40% reduction in GHG emissions by 2030 compared to 1990 um, emissions, um, um, the, the previous uh, commitment that uh, has to be achieved uh, is the 20% uh, emissions uh, reduction by 2020 compared to 1990. Um, as you probably know, uh, French policies are rooted in the European Union framework. So, so how does it work? The, the NDCs are the bedrock of the policies as they set the target for 2030 in uh, 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 the European Union. Um, then three fundamental uh, directives shape the framework of the national regulations. Uh, the, the EED, Energy Efficiency Directive, the EPBD, Energy Performance of Buildings Directives, and last but not least, the Renewables Directive. All the, these directives uh, are being uh, um, in revision by uh, the European Commission at the moment. In France, we do um, have um, important tool, uh, policy tools, the Energy Transition Law and the Housing Energy Renovation Plan. Uh, both tools uh, are, I'm going to present uh, uh, both tools um, in my presentation on the following slides. Um, moving on to um, the, the, the energy consumption and GHG emissions in France, um, the building sector uh, accounts for 43% um, uh, of the uh, the whole, uh, the total energy consumption, and um, the the figures for uh, um, GHG emissions are similar to uh, what I he heard from Canada. Um, the the G the buildings uh, account for um, the buildings emissions account for 21 percent of the total uh, GHG emissions. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the French administration, uh, administrative uh, organization as it was renewed in 2007 in a way that is quite important to, to the, uh, the implementation uh, of the, the relevant policies. So in 2007, the president of, of France uh, at the time decided to gather uh, in the same ministry uh, the policies relevant to environment, energy, housing policies, and climate negotiations issues. And um, he created the Ministry of Ecology, Energy, Sustainable Development, and uh, um, climate negotiations. Uh, moreover, uh, this, uh, this new um, uh, 
uh, configuration made easier uh, the the launching of uh, the Grenelle de l'Environnement Roundtable, which was uh, quite an important conference, bringing together the government, uh, uh, the government, the local authorities, the trade unions, uh, business uh, and market uh, people, and the uh, voluntary sectors, and. Um, this gave uh, the opportunity to draw up an action plan to tackle uh, all uh, the, the environmental issue. And uh, uh, we can say now that both Grenelle de l'Environnement and this Redimension Ministry were a turning point in environmental policies uh, and in, in uh, energy efficiency policy uh, in France. Um, uh, unlikely uh, Canada, uh, France is a unitary state, not a federated one, so uh, laws and decrees are edicted by the government at the national level. Uh, we, do, we have building codes that, uh, in which are defined uh, uh, the, the regulations targeting efficiency of buildings. All, um, which means uh, that uh, all over the country, the developers have complied with uh, this uh, unique regulation. Of course, uh, this regulation uh, in the field of uh, uh, thermal regulation depends on local climate. It's true that uh, this organization tends to facilitate uh, and implementation, but uh, uh, it couldn't succeed uh, without uh, the, the involvement of uh, local authorities, uh, because regulation isn't, isn't the only leverage to foster energy efficiency. So uh, I'll, I move to the uh, I move now to uh, an important uh, uh, policy tool. Uh, the act relating to energy transition for green growth. Um, we had, um, of course, uh, as you can imagine, this law was prepared in the supportive environment of uh, COP21 and the Minister of Ecology of France, Ségolène Royal, uh, was and still is uh, deeply committed to launching a significant energy transition process. Um, the Act uh, is consistent with the process uh, that has been implemented since uh, the Grenelle with regard to improving both new and existing building stock. Um, that's uh, an important point uh, to raise. So the Act uh, sets out medium and long-term goals and as, as well as uh, operational measures. And uh, they, uh, all uh, the, this uh, framework consolidated uh, a um, fundamental strategy for uh, uh, energy efficiency in France, the 2014 French strategy. Uh, and so it, it is so called uh, the Housing Energy Renovation Plan. Um, uh, I would like to. Uh, um, highlight uh, the key po some key points of the French innovation strategy. Uh, the building sector uh, uh, accounts for 35 million uh, of dwellings in France, and uh, the, the, the energy uh, transition law uh, aims to um, renovate uh, a rate of uh, 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 500,000 uh, dwellings renovated per year by 2017, uh, uh, yes, 17, included uh, 120,000 in the social housing stock and 380,000 uh, dwellings in the private housing stock. So this strategy, strategy is based on three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is um, uh, the development of a specific support 
to house, households, especially uh, households suffering from uh, um, energy poverty. Um, and this support uh, tends to provide uh, appropriate advice and uh, it is based, based on the involvement of local authorities. I, I come back to this point uh, very soon. Uh, the, the improvement of the financing scheme uh, was uh, spotted as a, a, a crucial point uh, in the discussions of the law, uh, especially uh, towards uh, disadvantaged uh, households again. And uh, last but not least point, uh, uh, the necessity of uh, um, to uh, involve uh, all the stakeholders uh, um, uh, was uh, um, an, an important uh, issue. Uh, craftsmen building companies are now uh, involved in the development of uh, a better cost controlling uh, and quality of works uh, scheme. So uh, a few words about the way uh, the support uh, of households is uh, organized. Uh, um, uh, um, um, a network of uh, regional energy renovation platforms uh, all over the country uh, uh, was uh, implemented and these platforms uh, provide uh, information to, to visitors, to households and um, in, in this, uh, these platforms people uh, and uh, families uh, can um, uh, find um, counselors that uh, uh, are uh, in charge of uh, helping them in their uh, renovation um, project. So, uh, uh, so far much uh, information uh, was provided in uh, these uh, re renovation platforms. Uh, the financing of uh, energy renovation works had to be uh, improved and made uh, uh, more simple that, than it was. Uh, an important program, uh, so-called Habite Mieux, Living Better, was implemented by uh, the National Agency of uh, Housing uh, to combat fuel poverty. Um, um, a rate of 70,000 renovations of dwellings uh, was attained uh, uh, year, uh, last year, in 2016, and we expect, expect uh, one hand to be able to found uh, uh, 100,000 renovations in 2007. The, the relevant renovations account for an average energy saving of 40%, so it is um, very important in the, the strategy to support uh, and to continue um, this, uh, this program. For uh, public social housing, uh, a specific loan scheme uh, was implemented to foster uh, energy renovations and um, uh, the tax credits uh, scheme uh, was made uh, more simple that in, uh, than it was and the tax credits are now uh, available to households with to renovate their own property. The only uh, requirement is to, um, to uh, have um, the, the renovation or works achieved by a certified uh, craftsmen or uh, companies. Um, now uh, let me show you uh, just a, a snapshot of of uh, what is going on uh, on the energy efficiency f uh, of, uh, in the field of uh, new buildings. 
We uh, we have a, a, a current regulation targeting uh, uh, new buildings. Uh, um, to developers have to achieve a near zero energy buildings uh, in accordance to the energy performance of buildings directive. So uh, we are now. Uh, working to prepare uh, the following uh, step and uh, to include uh, more reno renewables uh, and uh, in the, the, the new buildings and uh, we are also working on a low carbon building uh, regulation uh, using and um, uh, tending to use uh, the, the um, life cycle uh, um, analysis approach and an experiment was launched uh, to encourage front runners to go further and to uh, uh, build uh, such uh, high performance buildings. Um, I I would like to uh, move to uh, the, my last slide and to come back to uh, the renovation strategies and to show how uh, um, a European directive can be a very useful framework uh, to help uh, member states to implement uh, the national policies. Uh, actually. Um, the Article 4 of EEE uh, set uh, five uh, main uh, uh, aims of uh, the renovation strategies. Uh, it, uh, the, it has to uh, encompass uh, an overview of uh, the national building, building stock, uh, as well as the cost-effective approaches uh, relevant to the building. Uh, um, it has to encompass as well uh, measures to stimulate effective deep, deep renovation, perspective to guide uh, the investment decisions, and uh, um, uh, evidence-based uh, estimate expected energy savings. And you can see that 34% uh, uh, um, of the strategy address uh, ED main elements. And and uh, 10 uh, countries uh, fully comply uh, with uh, the EED. Uh, I confess that uh, France uh, com fully complies uh, with uh, the, the Article 4 of, of EED. So I think it's, it's very interesting to um, uh, have a good view of what happens at the regional level, at the national level, and, that, and at the EU level. It uh, maybe it's uh, it's uh, a key uh, to to uh, to success. So thank you and uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you to to all of our panelists for those uh, fantastic presentations. Uh, as, as we shift to the Q&A, I'd just like to remind everyone again to enter your questions into the questions pane as they come up along the way. Um, we'll also keep up uh, several links on the screen throughout for quick reference that point to where to find more information about upcoming and uh, previously held webinars. Okay, so the first, the first question uh, is directed to Sarah. Um, but I, I think others might like to speak to it as well. Um, and the participant asks, what is one lesson Canada can share with, uh, with other economies on preparing subnational governments for implementation of national building efficiency policies? So certainly we have, there's a number of, uh, in Canada, um, sort of structured forums and less formal forums for engaging uh, with provinces and territories. Um, in particular, with respect to the buildings uh, component of our pan-Canadian framework, we work through the federal, provincial, territorial uh, body called the Energy and Mines Ministers Conference, 
which is a annual gathering of federal, provincial, and territorial ministers responsible for energy. Um, there are similar uh, ministerial level um, uh, forums for environment ministers, for example, as well. Um, and so those are some of the formal mechanisms that, uh, that you know, and then at the officials level there are various different working groups that are established to support the ministers in, in, those, uh, in those established formalized forums. Um, but of course as well we, we also rely heavily on um, solid working level relationships with provinces and territories. Um, we, uh, we work bilaterally with, with many of them um, and engage with them regularly in an effort to both seek their views, understand what, what their programs and policies are so as to harmonize um, you know, national, national initiatives. Um, and, uh, and I think sort of those, those two approaches, the formal and the informal, hopefully create um, an environment where there's, there's information sharing dialogue and uh, in many respects, you know, trying to leverage uh, programs that might exist at the subnational level with ones that we might be looking at at the federal level and vice versa. Does Great. that... Thank you very much. That, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, would any others like to comment on the uh, subnational national uh, intersection? All right, uh, we'll, we'll turn to the next question. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about the NDCs as a, as a driver, but uh, of, of growing building energy efficiency work. Uh, but one question is about the intersection of NDCs with other pre-existing national development plans uh, and existing building code initiatives. So in other words, NDCs are, are driving a, pri a priority focus on it now, but how you, in, how you uh, weave together uh, building energy efficiency with other national development priorities outside of NDCs uh, to drive their implementation. Uh, this is Jennifer. I'm happy to chime in a little bit if, uh, on Great, this thanks. question. Uh, I mean, I think that there are really uh, a couple of critical things, and this is true for the, the national to subnational dialogue as well. Uh, I mean, the, the reality of working across uh, ministries or in sort of a horizontal or vertical policy alignment, and I think Sarah used those terms as well in her comments, the, the, the key is to create uh, sort of shared outcomes that are going to be uh, implemented um, through a combined set of activities. So if you're if you're looking at a, and again a, thinking about a, a public works department or a permitting office and a an environment office um, in the case of a place like uh, Mexico City for example where we're working to help support the localization and implementation of a building energy code that Mexico as a country has had uh, for several years already on the books. But the, the, the linkage is critical across these departments and the, and the goal uh, to success or the key to success is creating these shared goals. Um, and what we have not seen yet is in many of the plans that are coming forward, um, the outreach and engagement around sectoral lines. Um, WRI is, um, is honored to be uh, helping uh, support uh, a group of countries uh, that are building what's called the NDC Partnership Initiative. Uh, and in that effort, they're looking at what are going to be the critical needs uh, in doing exactly this type of sectoral work, um, building on the sectoral strategies, focusing on national goals, and then setting up these implementation approaches that can, uh, can bridge across uh, the industries. 
and the uh, and the and the ministries or departments that are in charge, but it will take it will require a deliberate structure. Um, I was really um, impressed by uh, uh, by Mary Christine's comments as, as well as others of, around how you begin that process. Um, but as you saw in my remarks. Uh, the the engagement and the ability to build trust across sectors, across departments or ministries, um, is an area around sort of our human capacity for risk, um, for our ability to co-create, uh, and the need for, for shared accountability, for shared um, implementation uh, authority, uh, and to build a budgetary approaches. Um, as I highlighted, that are going to overcome some of these very real uh, first cost challenges. Uh, if you're working in energy efficiency, often uh, the operational savings are seen by a different department than the uh, than the, the department that has to make that investment in the capital stock or the, in the in the first cost. So we really have to be deliberate about those strategies in order to create the linkages um, for uh, for a successful d implementation uh, in the building space. Great, thank you very much. Uh, just pause for a second in case any others would like to jump in on that question. Great, our, our next question is about uh, public funding for energy efficiency. Um, there's two, two uh, attendees have asked about this. Um, I'll, I'll put both questions together. Uh, so one is, is curious about uh, Level of public funding, understanding this uh, varies across countries greatly, but uh, the levels of public funding available to support uh, sort of policy development uh, in terms of data collection, training, building code design, et cetera, uh, as differentiated from technology and energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency technology investment. Uh, so what level of public funding there is and uh, sort of how to, how to grow that pie and where it should focus is one question. Uh, and the other is uh, what role federal governments and your various experiences should have or have had in uh, funding local governments for implementation of energy efficiency. Sorry, that was a lot, but the, the first question is about uh, public funding uh, for energy efficiency policy development and data collection and training, and the second one is about the intersection between federal funding and local funding and uh, funding flows there. This is Meredith. Um, I, I think it, it is a challenge to find the adequate funding and, and so it is a, a really important question to consider. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, one model that I might mention that has tried to augment the funding available at the local level is um, in the U.S under many state utility programs, the states can take credit, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the utilities can take credit for investments uh, related to, for example, the building energy code or other um, policies if um, they carefully document it. So um, state utilities, and that's against their um, requirements to um, produce energy efficiency uh, under state uh, portfolio requirements. So you can see in many states the utilities investing either in um, efforts to improve implementation of the Building Energy Code or in some cases uh, in the infrastructure that um, may, may also support that. And in, it's also linked up with a system to um, document, to assess what the compliance rate is. So that makes it easier for um, utilities to be able to get that credit. Yeah, this is Jennifer. I mean, I I think that the the we need to be um, as you saw in the numbers that I presented. We need to be really careful. The public investment in energy efficiency is unlikely to deliver the level of change we need. Um, this is going to have to come down to uh, private investment uh, and public investment as a catalyst. Uh, 
Um, when I look at the mechanisms that have been some of the most successful mechanisms, you know, we, we are seeing, as, as Meredith said, clearly, you know, the role of the utility in offering incentives and rebates, the ability for uh, state energy offices in the United States to create uh, grant programs that can overcome some of the, um, pay for some of the incremental cost of, of uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and then there's the ESCO market in the United States and in, in the U.S. Estimates are that the utility programs are about $6 billion a year and, and the um, ESCO markets are about $6 billion a year uh, in, in funding. Um, those are catalyzed through public policy goals and through um, policy action, but it's in private investment uh, that is often uh, ultimately uh, being leveraged in, in those, into those programs uh, in the ESCO side of things. I know in, in delivering some of the most uh, innovative uh, building efficiency and renewable energy projects, uh, the 3P model has worked well where the private sector is on the hook for performance levels and makes the investment in a public infrastructure. Now there are pluses and minuses to that system, but I believe in, in Canada, um, schools and hospitals in many instances are using that in the United States. Many state governments like Hawaii are turning to that uh, approach, ESCO approaches and 3P models because public funds simply can't raise a $40 million investment. And that's what Hawaii is putting into efficiency and renewables now. Um, to be able to be much more uh, energy independent through the matching of those two resources. And I think that's the, the type of investment um, that we're going to need to be looking at and the approaches we're going to need to be looking at worldwide. It's, it's Sarah here, just to jump in and, and sort of rein, reinforce that point. I mean, I think certainly from, from our perspective, we're very conscious of, um, you know, the, the need for, for private sector investment in this space and um, very cognizant of ensuring that federal funding, whatever that might be, doesn't crowd out that kind of private sector uh, investment and funding. And I think too, um, given, given our, um, uh, given, given our structure, uh, having to, with the, working with the provinces and the territories, um, we also need to be very cognizant of um, ensuring that federal funding does not cannibalize or um, sort of replace existing funding in programs that are um, working well at the provincial or territorial level and ensuring that there's sufficient flexibility so that subnational governments can in fact tailor their programs to their regional circumstances. Um, Canada being such a, uh, a, a diverse, large country, um, that local decision making and regional circumstances are, are very paramount in ensuring success in program delivery. Great, thank you both. Uh, that's a good segue into a related uh, question uh, that's, that's come up uh, about uh, the existing built environment. Um, so the, the participant asked if, you, if uh, we could talk more about engaging the private sector uh, in working on existing built environment. Uh, Jennifer mentioned lock-in. Uh, Sarah mentioned 75% of uh, buildings in 2030 will be already existing. Uh, so the, the question is about what to do to engage the private sector specifically on existing building stocks. This is Jennifer. I, I, I want to um, say that one of the, the things I have been most heartened by in the last two decades uh, has been the beginning of what I'd consider to be sort of differentiation within the uh, real estate community. Uh, that is not exclusively based on exclusively based on location um, or facades, um, and that is around green attributes. I mean, I, we look at the scale up of the uh, of the aspirations towards green buildings in many markets around the world. This has truly been a transformative conversation around green buildings. Now, the question is. Is, the, is there a, 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 um, an approach that uh, allows us to recognize uh, the ability for us to differentiate on climate performance in these buildings? Clearly, in existing building stock, um, we, we need those kinds of mechanisms, um, and we need to be thinking carefully 
uh, about the private sector, which ultimately has the role to play, whether that's in, in, in technology sales locally um, or in the ability to think about just getting different equipment into those buildings. Um, one of the most interesting conversations I had recently was with a country that said we're, uh, we have a, a tremendous problem with our existing building stock, uh, but we also have a problem because we're technology takers. Um, we don't have a strong manufacturing base locally. We don't have a, a strong local employment um, approach for the energy efficiency. And so we, they were looking at this as, you know, what are we going to do to, in terms of transforming our economy, um, making this a local uh, opportunity. And renovating buildings that are existing um, is very much a local job uh, creator. And so I think part of the linkage to what we would consider the sustainable development agenda is to focus on existing buildings, not just on the, uh, on the new buildings, but focusing on those existing buildings and then finding ways, like we've done with the green building movement, um, to create a, ca a, a amount of clout around that, around the renovation process in, in the existing building space. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we're, we're running out of time, so I wanted to uh, thank uh, the panelists again for that informative uh, question and answer session. For questions we didn't have a chance to get to, uh, we'll, we'll connect with those attendees offline, uh, and we'll also be posting the slides uh, from this webinar on the website as well. The link is, is on the screen there. Now, and before we close, I'd like to just offer each of the panelists an opportunity to make any uh, closing remarks you'd like to make, and perhaps we'll go in the order that you all presented, starting with Sarah. Uh, sure. Well, I, in, in closing, um, we, uh, we look forward to continuing this kind of engagement with, uh, with our international partners. Um, it's through those kind, these kind of forums that uh, we can glean best practices and um, you know, put forward proposals for policies and programs that, uh, you know, that will help us achieve our targets in 2030. And I'd like to thank the organizers for thinking of us and inviting us to participate in this. Uh, it's been really valuable. Thank you. Thank you, um, and I'd also like to thank the Clean Energy Solutions Center for hosting us. Um, it's really encouraging to hear about the great work that's going on in Canada and France and so many other countries, and to see countries start to grapple with these issues, which are not necessarily new, but there's been a new impetus, I think, following um, the, um, the COP in Paris to come together and try to solve these issues. Um, and recognizing that it, it is not simply going to be an added cost to us, but it's going to be transformative, as Jennifer mentioned. So um, thank you again, and uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation. I just want to, I guess, reiterate the five things I think need to happen and that we'll be looking for uh, as we move into an implementation phase with NDCs. And that's really around you know, policy alignment uh, across departments and uh, vertical policy as well as horizontal policy alignments. Um, revised budgeting and procurement strategies that will allow energy efficiency investments to be, uh, to be attractive to the market. Um, the focus on, the third one is the focus on passive or net zero energy and the need to really, um, again, build the private market towards those um, goals. And then fourth, de de developing stronger funding mechanisms um, that incent the low, total lowest cost of ownership options. And then finally, this this idea that we can uh, that we can create um, some milestones and guideposts along the way, and how we do that with our industry colleagues, uh, and and create that uh, that linked set of metrics and goals. And and I think that's something the building efficiency world uh, has yet to develop. And and I hope the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, which France stood up uh, if in a time for the COP21 and their presidency, uh, can continue to help align and build this. Uh, this work together. This is Marie Christine. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me, and uh, I was very happy to hear of uh, what happens uh, in other countries uh, out of uh, uh, Europe. And uh, as you said, you all said it's it's uh, um, for me it's very inter interesting to see that. Uh, 
all the countries are are committed to um, uh, to going forward, and uh, uh, so uh, it, it, it's not um, such a, um, an issue of money. Of course. Of course, funding is important, but what is important is uh, this new impetus and that uh, uh, everyone, uh, thanks to, to COP21, I, I think, is uh, now involved in the process. And it is a, this is a key issue because um, uh, the citizens are now uh, carrying out uh, renovation works, uh, uh, of course, they are happy to be fostered to to receive funds, but uh, the awareness is here. That that's my point, and that's why it's so interesting to have the, this kind of, of webinar. I I thank you again. Great, thank you all again very much uh, for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, uh, I'd like to also thank our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we appreciate your time and hope in return that there were some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support through our Ask an Expert service that I mentioned earlier. I uh, invite you to uh, check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, uh, as well as previously held webinars. Uh, you'll also find information there about upcoming webinars and other training events. Um, and we are now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions YouTube channel. Uh, please allow about a week for those uh, audio recordings to be posted. Uh, finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.